The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! And hello and welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. That's Malik Hill. I'm Joey Tysick. And we are at week one of college football. Malik's favorite day of the year is just in a few days. Malik, how excited are you for week one? I'm almost nervous. Like I <laughs> it's it's a, it's like it's like anticipating Christmas morning. Like, East Carolina makes you nervous? <laughs> <laughs> Incredible joke to start the <laughs> podcast. Not not exactly, Joey. Just whenever college football season ends, like I, I just count down the days until until it's finally back. Mm-hmm. And it always <clears> seems <throat> like so long. And and when it comes back around, it it just feels amazing. Yeah, no, I agree. Even with all the changes in college football, I just my love doesn't change. I, I, it's my favorite sport. Yeah, for me, like I always say, college football is not my priority. I like it. I enjoy it a lot. Um, but there's just, it's not like NFL where I'm going to sit and watch every game. I'll pick and choose my games a little bit more in college football. I won't watch the whole Saturday slate, basically. Um, but I'll keep an eye on the Big Ten teams and, you know, some of the bigger matchups. Um, but either way, it does signify that fall is right around the corner. Football season has started. So, like, this week is going to be fantastic for me. We just did our ONTV fantasy football draft last night, and then I have a fantasy football draft on Friday, college football on Friday with the Michigan State game, some Saturday games, more fantasy football, and then next week the NFL season starts, and it's just – it's my favorite time of the year as well. Um, so don't really have any news and notes. There hasn't been too many uh, crazy things. I guess the only one that I'll mention is Jonathan Taylor did not get traded after – Apparently, they didn't find a trade um, by the Tuesday deadline that the Colts set um, by 4 p.m., which is also when roster moves had to be made, um, all the cut downs for NFL teams. Um, And so now Jonathan Taylor will be sitting on the pine for four games, no matter what, even if they do end up finding a trade partner for him. Um, So this could get even uglier than it already is already. Um, And the Colts... I don't know. They're playing hardball, I guess. They think they can mend their relationship with Jonathan Taylor. I would say to be able to do that, it's easy. You just pay him, but they've already shown they're not willing to do that. And for the teams that were trying to trade for Jonathan Taylor, I don't know why, because the Dolphins were a team that was heavily involved in trade talks with the Colts. Apparently, there was one other team that nobody knows who it is um, that was making offers. But if you're the Dolphins, I don't know why they wouldn't just be willing to give up a first-round pick, to be honest. Now, I don't know what first-round picks they have, but don't you think that the Dolphins are kind of in a position where they could just go all in? And maybe not even a first-round pick. Maybe they can figure it out with, like, a second-round pick or something. Um, I guess the only clapback is that I did hear that the Colts were asking for Jalen Waddell in a trade for Jonathan Taylor, which would have been... I guess the reason they said no, but I don't know. It, it's just a weird situation in general. Do you have any thoughts on it? We don't have to linger on it, but um, first, I think it is pretty funny that you picked Jonathan Taylor in your fantasy uh, draft, even though he won't be back for weeks. Yeah, and it that was might a, blow up in your face. It might, but that was the risk that I took. Um, mm-hmm. It's funny because I was telling people last night that it, it's a big risk to take Jonathan Taylor. I took him in the sixth round, which felt a little early still, but I said, I think my team is good enough that I can take the risk. But then this morning I was listening to some usual fantasy football podcasts that I listened to, and they were saying that they would almost just stay away from Jonathan Taylor unless he fell to like the eighth round. So even now this morning, I don't, I don't feel great about it. Yeah. And I, after <clears throat> how he played last year, I also have no idea 
yeah. how to feel about him as a player because right. everybody expected him to be at the top, and he just mm-hmm. he fell off to a place nobody ever could have imagined. Yeah, and plus he is technically still on the PUP list. Now, I assume that's mostly because of the contract issue, but he also does have to have an injury to be on that list. So his ankle could still be nagging him a little bit, which is a little bit concerning as well. So even if he does come back. Um, but, yeah, it's a kind of a crazy situation. Yeah, I, I'm honestly not surprised they're just going to take their time with this one because I didn't even realize until I saw earlier, I can't remember if it was on a tweet, but the Colts don't have a player over 30 years old. Yeah. They are going for a full youth movement and just rebuilding and sticking with these young guys and seeing what they can build. Mm-hmm. And in that scenario, you don't need to rush back Jonathan Taylor. You don't need to try to win a Super Bowl or make some try to, type of incredible run and have the best running back in the league. Like, see what happens. Try to mend the relationship if you can. If you if it doesn't happen, you could end up trading them. But right, yeah, with this whole flip that you're doing with this team going all youth, I I don't see the yeah. yeah. And the the other thing too. I guess I didn't want to linger on it, but I'm going to. Um, the other thing that's crazy, too, is like Anthony Richardson has a heck of a lot of talent. We would both agree on that. Um, wouldn't the Colts want a star running back to pair with their potential star quarterback? Because I would think if Jonathan Taylor was on the team, teams would be more likely to be worried about Jonathan Taylor running the ball. And that would probably open up scramble opportunities for Anthony Richardson because it's one more threat that you have to worry about. Now, that puts a little bit more pressure on Anthony Richardson to make more plays. And then they don't have to really worry about the running back as they can basically more so focus on the spy on the quarterback rather than worrying about a running back almost at all. Um so I feel like formation wise it makes it easier for defenses as well. So we'll see. I don't know. But one of the best running backs in the league, out for four games at least. Maybe more. Okay, let's get to college football. No more messing around. And we're starting off right away with the Big Ten. I want to make sure that we get all of our Big Ten talk in, and then whatever time left we have, we'll get to the other the other guys out there. Um, do you want to go? kind of in order do we want to talk about kind of the bottom feeders real quick get them out of the way and then work our way to the top or do you want to just talk about the top guys north northwestern is they're they're just in a they're in they're in a rough place right now their coach got fired Mm -hmm. all the hazing allegations a lot of the players and the coaches are still in support of pat fitzgerald which is not a good look for the university Mm -hmm. I, i have if they win more than two games this season, that's a win. Yeah. Because it's just not looking good for them. Uh, Rutgers, they're Rutgers. Mm-hmm. They they don't have the high enough level of talent to hang with people in the East. It's unfortunate for them. Um. Besides that, I well, in Indiana, they the weird thing is Indiana has some good talent, mm-hmm. especially on offense and like on their defensive line. But I I don't know if Tom Allen. Like, I don't know if his voice is just, like, falling on deaf ears. Like, they've accumulated a, a really good amount of talent through recruiting and the transfer portal. Yeah. And for some reason, I just don't see it working out mm-hmm. once again. Like, Tom Allen might be one of the first coaches fired this season. Yeah. And that may – it's kind of unfortunate, but – um, Let me ask – They're bad and interesting. Let me ask you about a team that might be on the verge because of all the talent that they lost. Where do you put Illinois, then, in the Big Ten? I like them a lot. Really? Yeah. I, I don't obviously I don't pay attention to their uh their refill back from what they lost, but they lost Tommy DeVito, they lost Chase Brown, both to the draft. So Yeah, they've they've recruited very well at the running back position. They're bringing back two guys who were in their rotation last year. They brought in Luke Altmeyer from Ole Miss, who only played a few games there, but was a four star recruit from Mississippi. He has a ton of talent. He can throw it and he can run. They, I, I love what they are building. I love what they've done since Lovey Smith left, mm-hmm. and they've they've just rebuilt a tough culture within the, like the past three years. I, obviously, they've done an incredible job at defensive back because they've had first or second round picks over the past two years at that position. Mm-hmm. 
So, I, yeah, I think they're a sleeper in the Big Ten West. They're a team I wouldn't take lightly. Okay. They almost beat Michigan last year. Um, another team that's on kind of a, a similar vein, Minnesota. Losing Tanner Morgan, losing Mo Ibrahim. How are they looking? Now, Minnesota is a team I think you might have to check in for next year. Hmm. I, I'm not sure how Minnesota's coaching staff is high on Ethan Kaliak Manis. Some people call him the Greek freak. He's one of the few Greek quarterbacks in college football. He's a sophomore. He's still kind of raw. He's, he has a big arm and he can move. Mm-hmm. But nobody knows exactly what he's going to look like out there. They've had Tanner Morgan for six years. Right. Yeah, like you said, Mo Ibrahim is gone. So they're bringing, they have a new starting running back. I like who they brought in at a receiver. They actually brought brought in a transfer. And I, at, at running back, they brought in a transfer from Western Michigan, Sean Tyler who's really electric and really fast. Mm -hmm. And they brought in a few transfers at receiver who I like also, but I don't know if they'll have enough offense or consistency to like keep pace with teams. I don't know if their defense will be good enough. Yeah. So yeah, Uh, they're kind of like in the middle, kind of below average to me. Okay. Um, I guess another one that I just thought of too, is Purdue losing Aiden O'Connell. Um, they lost their, their top receiver as well. Um, to the draft, where do you see Purdue fitting into the whole middle of the pack? That's I'm I'm higher on them than most teams. I'm not sure if they win more than six or seven games, but Ryan Walters was a high level defensive coordinator, a young guy at Illinois. Mm-hmm. He got the Purdue job. He brought over Graham Harrell, who runs the air raid, so they're still going to throw it around, throw it around a lot, like Aiden O'Connell did. Yeah, uh, they brought in um, a Hudson Card from Texas who played pretty well in his time when he got his chances. He's going to be the starting quarterback. Uh, they bring back uh, Devin Mockaby, who was a freshman walk-on last year that just came out of nowhere. I like what they've done in the transfer portal. They bring back some solid receivers. They've got some good talent on defense. I think they can surprise. Mm-hmm. But I don't think surprise in terms of like eight, nine wins. I think they can make a bowl game and not just be like flat-out bad yeah. in Ryan Walter's first year. So I – I like Illinois more than Purdue, but I like Purdue more than Minnesota also. Okay. Um, Then the two other kind of meddling teams, I would say Nebraska and Maryland. With Nebraska, it's it's about what they are two or three years from now. Matt Rule's first year at schools is never great. Mm -hmm. They have the talent to make a bowl game. Nebraska fans would still be disappointed if they didn't make a bowl game. There's a lot of hype around Jeff Sims coming in from Georgia Tech. And what he could be in that offense. But yeah, it's it's all about what Matt Rule does in like year two or three. He had Temple ranked in the top twenty five within three years. Yeah. He brought Baylor from 0 and twelve to the Big Tw- Big Twelve championship within two years. Like he knows how to build a program in college football. Mm-hmm. What happened with the Carolina Panthers doesn't matter anymore. Like he is a high level program builder on the college level, and I expect him to be able to do it at Nebraska. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if they'll get back to whatever Nebraska fans think they should be at again. Yeah. They should be an eight- or nine-win program, mm-hmm. and I, I think Matt Rule can get them back to that. Right. What they are this year, I'm not sure. Yeah. They could potentially make a bowl game, but we'll have to see. I'm, yeah, I, I just don't know. Yeah. And then Maryland? They're going to scare a few teams. Yeah, I, I know you've kind of hinted at it a few times. Yeah, they could possibly scare Michigan, but Michigan has handled them on the road like the past three or four times they've played them. Mm-hmm. I think Maryland might scare Ohio State at Ohio State because they have the quarterback and the offensive skill talent to keep pace with Ohio State at least for like a half or three quarters. Yeah. Like they'll they'll have them really like going back to the drawing board a few times and getting frustrated. But I don't know if they – I don't think they have the defense – to just flat out stop Ohio State. We'll have to see what Ohio State's quarterback situation is is like, which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah. So now we're uh we're to the big boys at the top of the top of the list, I guess. Um starting with I w- I'll save Michigan State cuz they're also kind of the middle league team. Yeah. Um but we'll save them. Iowa ranked 25 to start the season. Where do you see the Hawkeyes going? They got to replace uh, Sam Laporta, but they are tight end you. Yeah. How do you think they're going to fare this season? It is all on the back of Cade McNamara. It is literally like Iowa fans have looked at him almost like a savior 
Mm-hmm. And it is incredible seeing how decent he was. <laughs> now, he he helped lead them to the playoff and get Michigan back over Ohio State, and I respect Cade forever for what he did. Mm-hmm. But he was no means one of the best quarterbacks in the country. Yeah. He was maybe one of the four best quarterbacks in the Big Ten. Is he accurate? Yes. Can he make big throws when he needs to? Yes. But he's not very mobile. And the offense he's walking into, not sure if it does a lot for him. Yeah. And he's not fully healthy coming into this first week. Yeah, he's questionable still yeah, right which, now. Which has Iowa fans kind of nervous. Mm-hmm. But if he's fully healthy, I, I expect him to play good football, not turn it over a ton like their last few quarterbacks have. And they should win at least eight or nine games because their defense alone is going to have them like beating most teams in the Big Ten West. Yeah, It won't be that hard for them. I mean, they, they have some really high-level defensive players. So, especially Cooper DeJean, who I think he was starting at safety last year. They're going to put him at corner this year. He's one of the best athletes in the country. He's a beast of an athlete. Yeah, He's like 6'1", 200 pounds. He can play corner or deep or safety. He's a ball hawk. He can hit. He's going to be a high-level def- uh, NFL prospect. Yeah. And so they should be near the top of the Big Ten West. I was going to say, Iowa's going to be your your usual boring defensive football. Um, Wisconsin. Graham Mertz moving on to Florida. Uh, but Wisconsin has become pseudo running back you, to be honest. Um, they always have some running back that just runs all over the place. Um, and Braylon Allen is next up. So where do you see Wisconsin fitting in? Well, they brought in a new coach in Luke Fickle, who Mm -hmm. everybody wanted, honestly, in the past few years. Yeah. And he's also bringing the air raid. I'll say it again, the air raid offense. Good luck. To Wisconsin. Yeah. Of all places. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Now... He's. They did a good job in the portal bringing in Tanner Mordecai from SMU who played in the air raid at SMU. Mm-hmm. A few receivers from USC and Oklahoma State. And they still have Braylon Allen. And they're, they're running a version of the air raid. They brought in offensive coordinator Phil Longo from North Carolina mm-hmm. who had 2,000-yard rushers during the COVID season. Javante Williams and Michael Carter who are both in the NFL now. Right. They both rushed for 1,000 yards their last year at North Carolina. So he, he runs the ball when he has – Capable running backs. Yeah. So Braylon Allen will get his touches. But yeah, they're they're gonna be competing for Iowa for that top spot. Yeah. We're just gonna have to see Iowa throwing it around as much as they're about to. It's gonna look so strange. Mm-hmm. So we'll just have to see it. Do you think anybody can contend with Wisconsin or Iowa? Honestly, I think Illinois is a sleeper, but we have to see how good Luke Mal- Luke Altmeyer is for yeah. them. But I, I think it's most likely Wisconsin or Iowa okay. at the top. Because yeah. looking at both of them, they both have cakewalk of a schedule. Uh, besides, Iowa has to play Penn State and Michigan State, maybe. Um, meanwhile, Wisconsin just has to play Ohio State. And then, of course, the big game would be uh, Wisconsin playing Iowa. Yeah. So we'll have to see. Uh, moving over to the east. This is where the top, top dogs are. Penn State. We haven't really talked about them yet. Um, the hype. The yeah. hype machine is back. Yeah. Yeah, this is supposed to be, well, it is James Franklin's most talented team he's ever had. Mm-hmm. Number one quarterback in the country, starting as a sophomore. You got two extremely high-level sophomore running backs. You got a good receiving core. You got two dominant O linemen that'll probably be NFL draft picks. You got some guys on defense. They've got everything they need to make a run. But their coach is James Franklin. <laughs> and he is like four and twenty against top ten teams in his in his uh coaching career. Yeah. I don't know how you trust him even with this much talent. I I just don't know how you trust them. Mm-hmm. Like, there are a lot of people predicting them to make a run to the Big Ten Championship and potentially make the playoff. And I... They got to beat Michigan and Ohio State. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... And they have to beat Iowa, even. Yeah, they, they actually... They've been more competitive with Ohio State than Michigan, which is the funny part. Yeah. Whenever they go to Ann Arbor, they've gotten smacked. 
and Michigan loses at night games at Penn State. But when they play Penn State during the day, they usually beat Penn State. Michigan does. Mm-hmm. So I, they've I I don't I don't know what to say more than they have the talent, but I I don't know how I don't know how to believe in them. Yeah, since they've never actually gotten it done. Mm-hmm. Like they have to they have to do something that they've never done. Finally, well they've they've won a Big Ten championship, but they couldn't get to the playoff. They have to finally become that team that looks like a top four team. Yeah. And could they possibly go eleven and one, be tied at the top? Yeah, it's possible. Mm-hmm. But I, I have to see it. I have to see it. I don't trust James Franklin. Fair. All right, now we'll move on to Ohio State. We've talked about Ohio State a little bit, obviously having to replace C.J. Stroud, but they are one of those teams that has to replace a really good quarterback uh, every so often. And they did finally name their quarterback. And uh, how do you think uh, they're going to fare? I'm going to say this exact same thing I said last year. Is Ohio State tough, Joey? Define What do you think? Define tough. What do you mean? Are they going to walk through the schedule and then get punched in the teeth by Michigan again? Is Ohio State tough, Joey? Mm, Are they going to? It depends. Are they going to lose to Michigan but make it to the national championship? They have have Marvin Harrison Jr. Mm -hmm. He's a top three pick most likely. Yeah. Their recruiting classes are stacked on top of each other. It's disgusting how much talent they have. Kyle McCord played with Marvin Harrison Jr. in high school. Mm-hmm. They'll most likely have a really good connection. Their defense is probably going to be really good through most of the schedule. I think they beat Penn State, most likely. Even though it could be a toss-up, depending on we'll see how both teams look down the road. Mm-hmm. Michigan has beat them twice in a row, and they're going to Ann Arbor this year. Is Ohio State tough? Yeah. I Listen, I asked this last year after they lost to Michigan in Ann Arbor. I asked if they were tough last year and Michigan kicked them in the teeth. I'm going to ask the same. I don't know. I I have no idea. They're Ohio State. I would say. They almost beat Georgia. I they, was going to say. They are, more beat to win a, they are more built to win a national championship mm-hmm. than built to beat Michigan. Yeah. Which at this point. Which is something impressive. <laughs> which like something to gloat about. Honestly, I think that's something that Michigan needs to start thinking about. Do they want to just be able to beat Ohio State every year? Or do they want to get past the first round of the playoff? Well, that takes beating Ohio State more than twice in a row. Maybe. Ohio it took Ohio State learned how to do that over years and years of building talent and yeah. It took a long it took a while for Ohio State to build who they are. And Michigan has never been that team. <laughs> Michigan can't recruit with Ohio State. So that's a, that's the first thing. <laughs> so how do you become a national title contender when you don't have that level of talent? This is the most talented team Michigan will ever have, and they're not as talented as Ohio State. I'm talking more about Michigan than Ohio State. But the, <laughs> I guess this is where we're at with Ohio State. Yeah. Like, we, they're built to win a national title. But if they get kicked in the teeth again by Michigan and they come in like fourth again in the seeding. Yeah. We don't we don't even know who the number one seed is going to be, first of all, which it might be another toss up year, which is pretty exciting. Right. But Ohio State, we, we know what we know what's gonna happen. They're most likely gonna be eleven and one or twelve and oh. Mm-hmm. But are they tough? I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea. Their first big game is gonna be Notre Dame. Uh, middle of September, and then Penn State, middle of October, uh, Wisconsin, the end of October, and then Michigan to round it all out, the end of November. So once a month, they're going to have to bring their A game. Yeah. Last time Michigan beat them three times in a row was the 90s. Yeah. yeah. Good I'm luck. pretty sure you were a baby and I wasn't alive. <laughs> yeah, I would have been. So, yeah. Well, depending on when it was. It might have been the mid-90s. I might have been one. Okay. Yeah, around that time. All right. We'll save Michigan for last because they're the better team. <laughs> I like I like how happy you sounded when you said that, Joey. That, that gives me more optimism. Um, Michigan State. 
We've already kind of talked about it a little bit. But can I ask you a question before you start? Yeah, sure. Is Tuck still coming? That's a good question. I just had to ask that question. A lot of people are starting to get nervous about it. One, because the team has just not been there. They've had some talent. Um, Obviously, it's hard to, you know, him coming into Michigan State was a a very awkward transition period. And so you give him a little leeway. Then he signs a huge extension. Um, because Kenneth Walker yeah, be, became Barry Sanders. They found a perfect transfer portal yes. player. He hit. Um, and the offense ran efficiently. They had good receivers and for a while. Because of Kenneth Walker, Peyton Thorne was be able to play efficient football yes. and hit deep, deep throws. Which is perfect for guys like Jalen Naylor, guys like Jaden Reed, yeah. who like to stretch the field. Um, so everything kind of came together. Now we're in another transitional period of just talent. And the big problem with Michigan State right now, you spoke to Michigan not being able to recruit as well as Ohio State. Michigan State is probably one of the worst recruiting teams out there, I feel like, lately. Um, They're a school that also struggles to get good NIL deals for players, which hurts. Uh, It's it's, Well, because of... um... Matt Ishbia, well, that's more basketball, but he also helped the football team. Yeah. And Mel Tucker in his flashy cars on the football field and taking the pictures. It looks like that would be a big selling point for kids. I, From what I've heard, Michigan State's not doing great with NIL deals and things like that. That is – that doesn't make much sense to me, honestly. It's, I, I think they should be doing very well. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> – On paper. On yeah. paper. Mel Tucker um, is a very cool coach, according to MSU fans. Yeah. But it just seems like they are struggling to get talented players in. And, you know, for the longest time, Michigan State was kind of the, let's bring in the three-star guys and turn them into our guys. The Mark D'Antonio special. Yeah. But is he here anymore? No. Um, is, do you think he's relying too much on the portal now? Possibly. To try, try and hit on something like Kenneth Walker again to try and get that spark. Maybe. Um, It's honestly, it's really hard to tell. And I, I know that part of it is definitely at least last year, they tried to kind of recreate that without Kenneth Walker. Um, But to me, you can't do that. If you have a a revolving door of running backs, like they do, Um, they used like three different running backs throughout the season. All of them, I thought, had potential. None of them seemed to really break away from the others. And with that, we saw Peyton Thorne struggle because it wasn't a, a, a leveled defense or a balanced offense. And Peyton Thorne struggled. Now he's gone, transferred to Auburn. He's Auburn's starter. He'll probably do good there, to be honest. I just feel like it's going to happen. That's just our luck. Um the running back room is pretty much the same for the most part, so maybe there's some some growth there. Hoping for a Jalen Berger breakout. He, some, should, he showed somebody, signs. Somebody. <laughs> I'll take somebody. I, I think that's the main guy the fan base is like hoping for. Yeah. Because he has the talent. Mm-hmm. Um, Jarek Broussard is good too, but he, yeah. I, I don't know. It was kind of, it was weird with Jarek Broussard. Yeah. They yeah. did lose Elijah Collins, like I think we mentioned last week, yeah. last week to Oklahoma State. Um, so maybe it, you know, makes it a little easier. Um, but again, we talked about it last week. The Keon Coleman loss is huge. We already knew Jaden Reed was going to leave for the draft or going to be gone because of the draft. Um, so that was a known quantity. Keon Coleman was not a known quality quantity. Um, so now, now the receiver room is kind of, up in the air now again very young it's again very young, outside of trey mosley yeah there are guys that can maybe step up that we've been hoping for yeah and montori foster hasn't played a lot but he's like a junior yeah so trey mosley kind of that next guy up he's a senior now he's the ultimate number two yeah very reliable yeah 6'2 200 
go up and get it kind of guy. I think one person has to break out in particular for yeah. them to make a bowl game and be successful. Mm-hmm. It has to be Antonio Gates Jr., you think in so? my opinion. Yeah. He's the highest re- highest level of recruited receiver mm-hmm. Mel Tucker has gotten. He's yeah. a Michigan kid. He has a lot of ability. Kind of like he's not as big as Keon Coleman, but he has the similar type of abil- ability yeah. to go up and get 50-50 balls and make circus catches. Mm-hmm. If he doesn't break out, I don't know who does, Yeah, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like, they're, they're a bunch of solid-looking dudes on that d- depth chart on paper. But Antonio Gates is the one with that, like, next-level talent. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, they also – yeah, because their wide receiver room is super young, guys with not a lot of snaps. Because um, I forgot Jeremy Bernard also went to Washington. Um, and then their tight end room is so weird, too. They brought in three tight end transfers, and they still have Malik Carr. Yeah. I don't know what that means exactly. And Does that mean, like, there was nothing behind Malik Carr? Well, and they had uh, – what's his face? I can't even remember. Um, Barker. Yeah, they, don't they still have Daniel Barker? Is I he think gone? they do, um, as far as yeah, I they, know. Yeah, they brought in a but bunch it, of transfers. It's too. not loading for me on the ESPN app, so okay. I, can't, I can't find out for sure. Um, and then they – like, yeah. I need them to get more out of their tight end, to be honest. I think that's kind of a big thing that could unlock this offense. Make make the easy throws. Because we haven't even gotten to Noah Kim. Um, or Kate Hauser. Yeah. yeah. Most people think it's Noah Kim, but yeah. eh. like that's a whole other situation of like where are they gonna go? I I I think that might be the biggest problem slash what could be the solution for this team. Yeah. The guys, the first and second year guys that Mel Tucker has recruited versus the transfers that he's brought in in the past year. Mm-hmm. How do they mesh? What works? Like, Caden Hauser is the four star quarterback that MSU you got excited about. Yeah. Caden Hauser has been in the system for some years. Who do you pick? Who do you prefer? <laughs> Antonio Gates is the four star wide receiver. You got some other guys that have been there for some years. Who's the breakout guy? Yeah. Like, when are the when do the recruits that you've brought in start making impact? Mm-hmm. And how much do you still put stock in the transfers? What's the balance? Right. What do you think it needs to be? 50-50 or, like, more recruits than transfers at this point? I think it needs like, to be more recruits than transfers. Okay. Um, because I, I think they need to just be built into the system, I guess, um, than to hope for a fit, I guess. If that makes sense. The other problem is the defense. <laughs> they got some talent in the front seven. They do. I don't think the front seven will be the problem. It usually isn't. Yeah. For the most part. Jacoby Winman coming back. He had a really strong start to last season. Mm-hmm. Then he got hurt, didn't he? Uh, yeah. Well, hit uh, Snow was the one that got hurt. Yeah. Snow got Darius Snow. Okay. He yeah, got yeah, hurt. Yeah. He's back. Mm-hmm. Jacoby Winman had a good stretch of sacks. Yep. I heard the defensive end they brought in from Texas A and M is re- is pretty good. Okay. And can make an impact. Mm-hmm. But like you see, yeah, the DBs. <laughs> yeah. Like outside of the that that say that uh big all Big Ten level safety. Who else do you trust? Which uh, which safety you're talking about? The kid from uh, did he leave? Uh, I'm He's pretty the kid sure from Ohio. I'm pretty sure their safety's left. Oh okay. Um, he was really good. I think he wore number three. Because I believe, because it's showing me, Kendall Brooks went for the NFL. He was like he was their like their best defensive back. Yeah, safety. And then, well, Kendall Brooks had a hundred tackles, so that, I don't know if that's who you're thinking of. No, I gotta look into. Otherwise, the there's Xavier Henderson. Xavier Henderson. That's who I was thinking about. And he also shows NFL. So. Okay, he's gone. But he didn't. <laughs> it doesn't look like he made a team. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, Ben Van Summeren is gone from the linebacking core, but I don't think people loved him yeah. a lot. Kyle Halliday is back. Mm-hmm. Tough guy, no gloves. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm looking at – and then their best cornerback, Amir Speed, is uh, with the Patriots. So that's leaving us with uh, – what's his name? A lot of young guys. Oh, yeah, Chester Kimbrough. 
yeah. couldn't remember his first name, who uh, was on a highlight reel for a lot of um, wide receivers. So. <sighs> so what's the record prediction, Joey? I don't know. They and should win six games. The problem is, too. They, they should make a bowl game. They still have offensive line issues, too. That has been their biggest bugaboo as well lately. Um, so Michigan State's in a really weird spot, and Tuck's got to be real decisive, I think. Do these first two games matter at all, Central and Richmond? I think they do. Uh, maybe not Richmond, but Central. I, the first impression of Central might matter. <laughs> right. It might matter a lot, yeah. Like, Central yes. yeah. usually is a team that's okay in the MAC. They're not supposed to be good this year, but they always have like they a have player a, or two. Listen, Bert Emanuel is dynamic. Yeah. If they let him run, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So there. So I think their first game on Friday is actually pretty, pretty important. Richmond, maybe not. Washington, Maryland, and, and Iowa is a tough three game <laughs> That's stretch, a gaunt- man. It's a gauntlet. That's a tough three game stretch. Then they get yeah. one week off with Rutgers, and then they're back to playing Michigan. Yeah, uh, they don't have an easy schedule. Listen, they also they, they ha- have to win every winnable game. Yeah, every single one. So let's see. One, you got you got to beat Indiana. You got to beat you got to beat Nebraska. Three, you four, can't five, you can't lose to Nebraska. You gotta you gotta win at, six. at Minnesota. They have to make a bowl game. They have to win That's six games. I, they should win six. If they, they don't win six, and in, in this year three with Mel Tucker, right? Year three. Mm-hmm. You you got to win six games because year one was with Kenneth Walker. Yeah, year two without. Well, year one was the COVID season, but that yeah yeah, yeah the, technically the Rocky Lombardi year, right? That barely counts. <sighs> got to win six. And out you of predict the- six, that's Central Richmond. Do you think they lose three straight? Washington, Maryland, and Iowa. Or do you think they get one? I think because Maryland is coming to throw it around. Man. I think they have a better chance against Iowa. At Iowa, that's tough. It is. <laughs> yeah. It is. But I, I think, I've said it before, Michigan State is a team that is, they're similar to Michigan right now, where I don't think they're a team that's made to make comebacks. And Maryland okay. can get on you early, and that's scary. Yeah, Iowa is more of a endurance game. Yeah. Can you make it through? That's where I think Michigan State can at least hang around. Um. So, you know, if things go right, I think they can maybe do something at Iowa. Um, and it, it gives them a little more time for their offense to click. Um, so I think that might be the game that they could maybe steal away from somebody. Yeah. So I would definitely say six or seven. Um, I want to say seven because I think they could steal one off of somebody. If they, can but, be, if they beat Maryland, I think they can get to seven. Yeah. I think it has. They have to win like Maryland or Iowa, yeah, to get to seven. Otherwise, if they don't win six, like, it is you beat you beat Maryland because neither of us give them a chance against Washington. Yeah, if you beat Maryland after Washington, there's good spirits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. If anything, those game like especially Washington and Maryland, those should give Michigan State opportunities to show what they like make plays like neither of those defenses are like terrifying per se so they can get their offense working even if they lose those games they can get a lot of reps for their offense I think that's my thought process and that's why I'm I'm thinking they're more likely to be Iowa because at that point they should be somewhat in a rhythm if they're three and one going into Iowa I would probably give them a chance if they're three and one going into that game yeah which then they could win eight games. But I think they just steal one. I don't know which one it is. I agree. I think it's probably Maryland or Iowa. Um, but, yeah, it, it's a spooky time for Michigan State, to be honest. Um, I think we're going to have to do quick summaries for the rest of the conferences. <laughs> yeah, we'll yeah. have to just mention it. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. We got to get Listen, the we're in, in Big there. Ten country. It is what it is. Right. And we can always talk about the other teams – Next week, anyways, because exactly. these games don't matter yeah. for most of these teams. Only if you do. Um, all right. Michigan, let's hear it. 
They got everybody back. Yeah. Basically. They've only lost, um, let's see, Ronnie Bell, Luke Schoonmaker, um, Jake Moody. Big deal. Yeah. Um, they usually, of course, they've lost some defensive guys, which they usually do. Um, but they bring a lot of guys back. So, where do you see uh, this team? I think this is the most conflicted I've been on a season in a while. The team expectations, all the players and all the coaches, their expectation is to win a national championship. I've never seen Michigan get close to winning a national championship. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how I'm supposed to personally buy in, even though this is the most talented they've been since the Lloyd Carr era. Yep. Even with the Jim Harbaugh, weird NCAA stuff going on, the team is locked in. I'm not worried about the kids. I'm not worried about them. Yep. The running back duo was ridiculous. Like Donovan Edwards might be like a top three running back in the country. And he's not, he's technically not even the starter. Mm -hmm. JJ McCarthy is back. He should take another step. I think a lot of people, I I don't understand why so many people were down on him last year. He threw 22 touchdowns to five picks and had a 65% completion rating Mm -hmm. in an offense that is like geared towards running. Yeah. So I think he did well enough in his first year as a starter even though he finished kind of in, yeah, he threw those pick sixes in the playoff game, mm-hmm. but he has all the talent in the world to take another step and they're going to make him more of a priority on offense. They, they've, they've got everything they need, yeah. but like I said, in the Ohio state part, I still don't think they're as talented as Ohio state in terms of development. Michigan is a better development program than Ohio State right now. Like, they take high three stars and, like, borderline four-star guys and turn them into all-American players. Yeah. Like, Rod Moore was a three-star safety from Ohio, like a high three-star safety that Ohio State didn't offer. Mm -hmm. He might be the best safety in the country this season, and he balled out against Ohio State last year. He's going to be, like, a second or third round pick. That's what the Michigan, like, football development has been in the past few years but i i just i don't know how i can see them winning a national title joey Mm -hmm. they've never done it yeah like they got over the ohio state hump in the past two years i was sad forever because i I felt like that would never happen and they finally did it and they're supposed to beat ohio state for a third year in a row yeah what year is it they were supposed to (laughs) they were supposed to beat tcu in they the were. college football playoff. And that's where it comes. Ohio State is built to win the national titles. They have a Michigan problem. Mm-hmm. Ohio- Michigan is now built to beat Ohio State. And they might have a playoff problem. And we won't see until they get there. That's the thing. Yeah. They are expected to moonwalk <laughs> through most <laughs> of the schedule. Yeah. For the most part. Mm-hmm. Basically until at Penn State. Right. And that game, I don't think, is going to be a night game. So Michigan has a serious chance to win that one. Yeah. The Maryland game could be a little scary. I also think the MSU game. It's going to make me nervous because MSU always makes me nervous. And it is at East Lansing. Yeah. So the crowd know. is going to be going crazy no matter how where MSU is in like in that season. Right. But it's it's going to come down to Ohio State. And I expect them to beat Ohio State at home. Beat them for the third time in a row. But Ohio State is built to win national titles. Yeah. (sighs) Got to be able to go through Georgia or Alabama. Joey. To make it. I think Ohio State's going to win it. Do you think they're going to beat Michigan Michigan then? I think it's going to be a tie at the top. I think it will most likely be a tie. I think Ohio State beats Penn State. We might lose to Penn State and beat Ohio State. And it'd just be a mess. I, I think Michigan beats Ohio State, but somehow, somehow, Ohio State still ends up getting there and winning the Big Ten. And they probably get the higher seed in the playoff. And Michigan probably slides in at like four. I just, I don't know. I think that's how it ends up happening. 
I hope Michigan can just straight up do it. Mm-hmm. It would be incredible if they went 12-0. and But that last three-game stretch is just brutal. Yeah. Like, I, I have no idea if they're beating Penn State. I have mm-hmm. no idea. And the worst part and beating is... beating Ohio State for a third time in a row would be incredible, but we I, I haven't seen them do it before, so I have to see them do it. Yeah. The worst part is you have to wait till November to find out. Exactly. That that <laughs> that is the gift and the curse of yeah. Michigan finally becoming what Michigan fans wanted them to be. They're ranked two in preseason polls, which means nothing. Mm-hmm. But everybody expects them to just walk all the way to the end of the season. And for the most part, like Michigan fans, we're watching week to week, watching these games, but we expect them to trample over everybody. Yeah. Through most of the through at least eighty percent of the season, mm-hmm. and it's going to come down to the last to Penn State and Ohio State. This season is coming down to two games. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I have to – I'm going to be excited watching them win throughout the season, but it's coming down to two games. Yeah. Yeah. I hope they go 12-0. and 0. They have the ability to do it. But I just have a feeling something is just going to happen where Ohio State gets to the Big Ten Championship. Michigan might be the better team, but – it it could be a really weird Big Ten season. There's a chance it could be a three team tie at the top. Yeah, and you're just gonna have to like look throughout the season to see who's number one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it'll be weird. But listen, the the team believes they can win a national championship. That's what everybody came back for. Right. Am I supposed to believe in them? <laughs> Should I, Joey? Should I believe they can win a national championship? Hey. That's what they believe. If I believe that the Lions can win the Super Bowl. I'm just, <laughs> um, okay, maybe I shouldn't believe Michigan. <laughs> no, but I mean, in, in the same vein, like, mm-hmm. if I think the Lions can make the Super Bowl, I think you have to have hope for Michigan to win a national championship. Um, they've proved that they are capable of getting there. Now. They should have beaten TCU last so, year, but they just played their worst game. They had shown for years that they could they probably have the talent to beat Ohio State. It could never get over the hump. Yeah. Now they've gotten over that hump. Now maybe we're just at that hump. They just got to win the first playoff game. If they maybe, listen, maybe that's all if it they takes. win the first playoff game, then but see that's all the way in December. Mm-hmm. I have to see them win a playoff game to believe they can win a national championship. Yeah. And that uh, listen, this this team is unbelievably good and I'm saying that sucks. Mm-hmm. What kind of fan am I? I, I, I just need to enjoy what this is because I don't know how long this will last. Jim Harbaugh might leave after this season. Yeah. Because he hates the NCAA. And I wouldn't be surprised if he was just like, I'm done. Mm-hmm. Even though he's told recruits like two, three years from now, he's going to coach them. Yeah. I don't know what Jim is going to do. Yeah. I have to enjoy this season. Plus, that's, they, that's what I'm going to do. They got good replacements for uh, yeah, like JJ and them. So they could be good for a little bit longer. So. Even the I listen, I'm already concerned because they were number two in this recruiting class and they've slid back to number eight. They can't get elite recruits. They just can't. They get like one or two every three years. And they, they don't have that elite guy. Jaden Davis could still be great, mm-hmm. but like on paper, they don't have that elite guy in this class. And it's just it's another really good Michigan class. Yeah. But to get over Ohio State nationally, you you can't be eighth. I think it's another thing that there may be Maybe not selling. I think Michigan is playing too old school, and they're they're selling their players by saying that we're a historic college football place. Whereas I think nowadays a lot of teams are saying, "Hey, we got some of the best NIL deals out here. Why don't you come play for us?" I think that might be part of it. I think Michigan's playing a little too old school. They got a lot of old heads in their uh, front offices and stuff, and their higher ups. So maybe I don't know. I should be happier. I should be happier about what this season it might be. At least be happy until November. Yes. You can start worrying in November. Yes, I, I'm not gonna walk on eggshells through most of the season, and that's yeah. fun. This isn't the Rich Rod era. This isn't the Brady Hoke era. Yeah, and then the Michigan Michigan State game. Maybe you can be a little nervous but all right let's talk about week one a little bit now that we've gotten the big 10 out of the way um kind of the big game of the week tomorrow night 
Florida playing Utah on ESPN. Well, that's not the big game. Of the well, game. it's one of. That's what is like top three. Yeah. Um. So I just kind of want to want to go in order. <laughs> I understand. Instead of I'm, jumping around. I apologize. I'm I'm sorry. So, what do you think of this game? Do you think Florida's going to be able to bounce back? Uh, now with Graham Mertz at the helm, replacing Anthony Richardson. Florida's in a weird spot. Very, very um, weird. But do you I, think they can bounce back at all? Or, I mean, Utah's a good team, so they can it's an uphill back. battle. It, 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 it's it all coming down to whether Cam Rising plays. Mm. He has been listed as number one on their depth chart that they released two days ago. But nobody actually knows if he's going to be the first quarterback to run out. And even if he is the first quarterback to run out, will he play the full game? Yeah. Nobody knows, and Kyle Whittingham, their head coach, won't give up any details. So Utah fans are just like, we're hoping, mm-hmm. we're hoping he's out there. Yeah, Utah is the better football team to start this season, but they were the better football team to start last season, also. And Florida won, mm-hmm. and Anthony Richardson made some big highlight plays and kind of won them the game. Yeah, Graham Mertz isn't the level of athlete Anthony Richardson is. Not many are. Yeah. Um. I I deep down I really hope Graham Mertz makes like a surprising I'm back season and just like yeah. puts himself back on the map. But it's hard to it's hard to see it actually happen. Mm, right. Like Florida has some good weapons, nothing special. Their running back duo is really good. They got a really good running back duo with Montreal Johnson and Trevor Etienne. Mm-hmm. Two guys that'll most likely be NFL running backs. Right. But their offensive line was most likely gonna be average at best. Their defense has a, a few really good playmakers, but nothing special. I, I honestly think this season it's going to hurt if they don't make a bowl game, mm-hmm. Florida. But it's all about what Billy Napier is doing on the recruiting trail. Right now, Florida has like the second best recruiting class in the country. And that's going to keep Florida fans and boosters happy. Yeah. Because he has some absolute studs coming in. I don't know if they – I'm, I'm going to say Utah wins this game. Okay. Even if they play their backup Bryson Barnes, who was a former walk-on. Yeah. I think Utah, that environment, it's not them playing in the swamp last year where they could get tired really fast. Right. This Utah <clears throat> environment, they play on a high level at home. And I think it's going to take a few weeks for Graham Mertz to really get into the swing of this. Yeah. And for their, for Florida to get on track. So, I, I got Utah winning. Okay. Yeah. Um. What's the other game that you're looking forward to? Not the Monday game or the Sunday game, the Sunday night game. So I honestly think the Friday game between Louisville and Georgia Tech is really interesting. Okay. I won't go too deep into it, but right. yeah, Georgia Tech just named Haynes King their starting quarterback. He was a guy at Texas A&M who played under Jimbo Fisher and ended up transferring because that offense was just ridiculous mm-hmm. for all of them, to, all that talent and that bad offense. And Louisville brings in Jeff Brom, who was the coach at Purdue, he played at Louisville. He's yeah. a son of Kentucky. He comes back home. They're also projected to be really good. They don't play Florida State or Clemson this season. Hmm. So they could possibly win eight or nine games. So a uh, pr- interesting ACC game to open up Friday night. Saturday, Colorado TCU at noon. Fox is trying to hype this up like this is going to be one of the best games of the season. Prime time. And I think I've said before – if Colorado wins more than three games, this is a, a successful season. Yeah. Four and eight is a good first season for Colorado. Mm-hmm. They're trying to hype this up like Colorado's are going to be like an eight, nine win team. Yeah. They have a lot of really high level talent at like three positions. The rest of the positions, I have no idea what Colorado is going to look like. Mm-hmm. TCU had lost a lot from their national championship surprise team, but I know a lot of the players they have. And I know the caliber of player they have at most positions. Yeah. It's better than Colorado Colorado at most positions. So I'm I'm I might take I don't know if I'll take the spread. I'm gonna take TCU when I bet this Saturday. <laughs> I'm gonna take TCU to win that game. I'm not gonna bet the spread, but yeah, I'll, it's not gonna be the game everybody hypes it up to be, in my opinion. All right. And finally, let's talk about LSU Florida State. The yeah. camping world kickoff. As they're calling it, I wish they played at Florida State. I was, I'm not a, the biggest fan of neutral site opening games. I wish teams would just, yeah. I'm a college football purist. What do you expect? Fair. What do you expect? 
That's fair. I mean, at least they're in Florida. Yeah. So, sort of a home game, but it's not their home court. Um, a lot of people are expecting LSU to maybe make that jump. Unfortunately, it's I have actually to... the Sunday game. I'm I'm sorry I interrupted you. Yeah, it's I Sunday. forgot it was the Sunday. Yeah, it's yeah, Sunday. Like Sunday. That's game. why I was saying it's yeah. it's like Sunday night football. Um, LSU. Some people think could make the jump this year be a surprise team. I'm going to be spite watching to see Keon Coleman at Florida State. <laughs> Um, I'm excited to see him play at Florida State. I can't wait. Stop it. <laughs> can't wait. Um, how do you think this game's going to go? This is probably the most exciting game of the weekend. Well, I would say it is just because it's two top teams. Yeah. I, I'm i not even going to lie. I, I'm i going to be rooting for Florida State throughout this season because I, I want them to return to the prominence they were once at. And last year was a great step for Mike Norvell, getting back to 10 wins. Mm -hmm. A lot of people thought he didn't have what it took. And last season, he made a big step. One of the biggest reasons, because Jordan Travis, he improved a ton. Yeah. And him playing a high level at quarterback made everybody else raise their level. Right. They got a 6'7 and a 6'4 starting wide receivers. Johnny Wilson is 6'7, 230. Yeah. And Keon Coleman is 6'4, 220. That is a mismatch yeah. nightmare for we both teams. I think we mentioned it the other day that it's just like their basketball teams when they used to run like <laughs> Jonathan Isaac and all those guys. Yeah. Six nine and everybody bigger. over six at yeah. least six six. Yeah. But this is gonna be a really competitive game. There's high level of talent on both sides. They've both done well recruiting. They've both hit their portal hard and replaced spots where they things were kind of weak. I'm fl I'm favoring Florida State because of that wide receiver matchup, mm -hmm. and I like Jordan Travis more than Jaden Daniels slightly. LSU's really deep on defense. They got some guys that are going to be like first and second round picks on defense. But I I wonder if it's going to take a few weeks for them to like gel as a whole because they got some transfer players starting at that DB. Yeah, <clears throat> Harold Perkins for LSU might be a top three player in the country. He's an absolute freak at linebacker and defend and as a pass rusher. I'm I'm just gonna go with Florida State. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of biased because I just like them, but yeah, that's it's, fair. It's though. like a, it's an evenly matched game. Mm -hmm. really. I, I wouldn't mind seeing Florida State coming back. Uh, like I said, I I like Keon Coleman. It stinks that he's not on Michigan State anymore, but I I would still root for him. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm kind of with you. Yeah. I think I'd like to see Florida State win. I don't really the ESPN have... matchup predictor has LSU 64.9%. Yeah. Which I can't agree with. Yeah. Because Florida Florida State beat them last year, and it's in Florida. Mm -hmm. like, like I said, I, if, if... LSU, LSU might be like a favorite in the big t in the SEC West, but I, I don't think it's that big of a difference. Yeah, I, I think they're getting a, a little too much hype. I agree. All right, and with that, we're already out of time. So, <laughs> like we said, maybe uh, for the start of next week, We'll do some recaps, see how teams are doing, talk about a, a, a couple other divisions, maybe here and there, conferences. Um, but we also have to talk about week one of the NFL season, so we'll at least talk about the Lions and stuff. So we'll we'll split it up and uh, preview the Lions Chiefs Thursday night. The pressure's NFL on. opener. The pressure. Are you sweating yet, Joey? Are you sweating? No, it's it's a win win. The lion. It unless maybe the Lions get blown out, maybe that's a disappointment. But we'll see. We'll talk about it next week. I have a tease for you. Um, but this has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next time. Ohio State is soft. They've been soft for the past two years. They're still going to be soft. Go Blue.